For some time now I've received uh, some requests to do a video lecture on psychoanalytic understandings of sexuality. So I thought tonight I would attempt to do that. This will likely be part one and uh, part two to come, hopefully in the not too distant future. Um, let's begin with uh, a general discussion of um, my fundamental disagreement with Freud's and um, in many ways the the general culture's attitude or or understanding of human sexuality um, Freud's fundamental model of human nature was described by Eric Erickson as a centaur model of the human being the centaur being that mythical beast that has the uh, head and torso of a man and the body of a horse. Um, Erickson in his gentle and excessively polite way is basically uh, rejecting the Freudian concept of human nature, this dualistic concept um, in which we are essentially half human and half beast. This is essentially a, a kind of platonic uh, vision. Freud followed Plato fairly closely. Uh, for Plato, uh, we have the passions, reason, and spirit. Uh, Freud associates the passions with the animal uh, part of human nature, with our animality, with our bodies. And uh, the ego is reason, and the superego uh, resembles Plato's spirit. Ego, rationality, superego, internalizations from society, religion, morality, the parents, education. Uh, so ego and superego are the human, the cultural half, the socialized half, uh, but for Freud, invariably attached to the beast, to the animal, to the id. The drives of the id for Freud are fundamentally rooted in somatic sources, the body. He did not mean the brain. He meant uh, bodily zones from which he thought both sexuality and aggression bubbled up from the body and then had to be dealt with by ego and superego defenses. Um, I think the, the general culture tends to think, as Freud did, of uh, sexual passions as sort of originating in the body and bubbling up to the mind. Um, and Freud thought that perhaps the sources of the sexual drive are in the genital regions, the gonads and uh, common sense would tend to go along with this. Freud was honest enough, however, to admit that he could not specify the somatic sources of the aggressive drive, and this uh, should have caused him to question the whole idea of the drives as bubbling up from the body. Of course, I think this vision of both human sexuality and aggression is fundamentally incorrect. Uh, why? Because I'm an existentialist. Um, in the sense that Eric Fromm is an existentialist, and Jean-Paul Sartre is an existentialist. Uh, for Fromm, um, man is the freak of nature. Uh, human beings are, uh, in the writings of one Sartre, a denatured animal, les animaux de nature, the denatured animal, the animal who is fundamentally uprooted at least partially from nature. Of course, our bodies tie us into nature. We are animals. Um, but uh, sometime in the second year of life, the human mind experiences a revolutionary emergence. Mind emerges from uh, body and brain mind is irreducible to body and to brain. Of course, the brain is the onlog, 
the necessary basis of mind, no brain, no mind, of course. But um, the television set is the necessary analog for the television program, no television set, no television program, but the program is irreducible to the set. I mean, if you don't like the program, do you call the, re the TV repairman? No, you're much more likely to, uh, to write to the producers and directors and say, listen, get better actors or get better writers. This is uh, a B movie. Uh, uh, and that's equivalent to um, what you do if um, you don't like what's going on in the mind. Um, the writers and the directors are perhaps analogous to the psychotherapist. If you don't like what's going on in your mind, does it make sense to call a brain surgeon or a psychopharmacologist, perhaps in certain rare cases? But you might be better to call a psychotherapist who functions like uh, an editor uh, 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 someone who can help you rewrite the poor programs that constitute your life, uh, that can help you edit and correct the stories that your mind consists of. Um, okay, human mind is an emergent. It emerges in the second year of life. Uh, I think Genesis pretty much got this right. Um, certainly Kierkegaard's interpretation of the Genesis myth, which he saw as myth, not as history. Um, they ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and they knew that they were naked, and they felt shame, and they fashioned fig leaves to cover themselves. In other words, this is the birth of self-consciousness. One could say the birth of the self sometime in the second year of life. And with this emergence of self-consciousness comes shame and guilt. Cain, where is thy brother, Abel? Guilt, shame, anxiety, freedom, and the anxiety that comes in the face of freedom. So this is existentialism. This sees the human being uh, certainly as an animal, but a very peculiar animal, an animal in which mind has emerged, freedom and self-consciousness has emerged, the capacity to make decisions has emerged. And of course, this is no celebration of humanity because this emergence puts us out of sync with the rest of nature. We are the most destructive animal. We destroy our own ecosystems. We destroy one another. Other animals are lived by nature. They are lived by their natural programming. We have emerged from the programming and we are not programmed. And hence we can be extremely irrational, self-defeating. Of course, we can be rational. Uh, other animals cannot truly be rational, but with our capacity to be rational comes our capacity to be irrational. Uh, with the emergence of human symbolic consciousness, where the language animal, the symboling animal, comes the capacity to be stark raving mad to have our heads filled with fantasies that are tantamount to delusions. Um, so to talk about the uniqueness of man as, uh, as Julian Huxley does in his famous paper with that title, The Uniqueness of Man, um, our uniqueness is not a celebration of our superiority over other species. It draws attention to the kind of destructiveness of which we are capable. Um, okay, but having emerged, having um, minimal biological programming, having the freedom and the capacity to say no to our programming, 
I mean, some people would like to think we are programmed to live, but of course, masses of people commit suicide. Not only directly committing suicide, but they go to war and they kill others and are killed. Um, we have the capacity to say no to our urge to live. Uh, we can starve ourselves to death, either because we're committed to our anorexia or because we're on a, um, uh, we're on a, a hunger strike for a political reason and are willing to die for the cause. Um, okay. Our sexuality is radically underprogrammed. I mean, other species, primates, go in and out of estrus. They go in and out of heat. Um, but human sexuality has only the slightest rudimentary traces of this kind of biological programming. There may be phases in the uh, menstrual cycle when a woman is maybe a little uh, more inclined uh, towards sex, but this can easily be overcome by a range of other factors. Her puritanical superego, which tells her all sex is sinful, um, or perhaps it can be overcome in another way through flirtation and compliments uh, and seductions. Um, human sexuality trickles down to the body from the mind. It doesn't bubble up from the body to the mind. It starts in the mind. Human sexuality is all about narratives, stories, scenarios, costumes, minimally biologically programmed. I mean, the evolutionary psychologists, uh, comparative psychologists, comparing different species, at the very bottom of the phylogenetic hierarchy, you have unicellular and then multicellular and then invertebrates and then vertebrates and then mammals and then primates and then man. And the further down you go in the hierarchy, the more sexuality and behavior in general is controlled by inborn biological mechanisms. But the higher up in the hierarchy you go, the less and less behavior is controlled by biological mechanisms and the more it is open to learning and to being controlled by experiences of learning. And then at the very top of the hierarchy, you have this emergence into symbolic consciousness where symbolic programming as opposed to biological programming really takes over. So, uh, Freud really gets this wrong, as does uh, so-called common sense. In many ways, Freud was a genius and he broke through common sense, but in this area, uh, he seems to have succumbed to it. Um, one of his greatest errors, of course, was to blame human destructiveness on the animal in man. <laughs> and, and common sense goes along with that. We call we call these, these killers beasts. Would that they were beasts. Only humans are capable of the kind of sadistic destructiveness that we see in Auschwitz, that we see in serial rapist murderers, uh, that we see in torturers. You have to be a highly empathic creature to be uh, a sadist because if you can't put yourself into the shoes of the other, you can't possibly enjoy the pain and humiliation you are inflicting upon them. You have to be empathic uh, to do that. To be a good psychopath, you have to be highly empathic. By empathy, you understand I'm not talking about sympathy. Sympathy and empathy are two different things. Empathy is the cognitive capacity to put yourself in the shoes and imagine what the other is feeling. And the psychopath is very good at this very often, uh, very skilled at imagining the words that need to come out of his mouth in order to get his mark to open up his or her wallet or bank account and give him the contents thereof. He's empathic. 
He knows what the mark needs to see in here in order to be conned. So psychopaths are highly empathic. They're utterly unsympathetic. They know how you feel. They don't care. And if they're sadistic psychopaths, um, they're thrilled by the pain and humiliation that um, they are inflicting upon you. Okay, this is the human being. Human destructiveness cannot be reduced to anything biological or animalic in man. It's uniquely human. Uh, okay, our sexuality is pretty uniquely human. Of course, once the stories, the scenarios, uh, the images uh, turn us on, then of course our bodies become aroused and become capable of erection and lubrication and uh, orgasm. Sure, that's the body, but it starts up here with the images and the scenarios the narratives and the stories, because we are the symboling animal. Uh, okay, uh, in abstract theory, Freud got this wrong, um, but clinical psychoanalysis, uh, while operating with, on a general level, this, this wrong thinking has nevertheless made a lot of contributions into understanding human sexuality on the level of the stories that it involves. Take the Oedipal story, a triangle. Oh, her husband's out of town. Hmm. Uh, now there's uh, an Oedipal possibility. There's a triangle, me, her, and the husband who's out of town. Um, a million variations on the Oedipal triangle, a million stories, a million Oedipal stories. Some, some men are really hooked on cuckolding other men. Other men are really hooked on being cuckolded by other men. Um, uh, some men can only be interested in married women. Some women can only be interested in married men. Um, well, I could go on forever about the complex variations of the Oedipal story. My point here is that it's a story, and it's a story that repetitively governs a person's sexuality. And these stories are highly individual. I mean, they have commonalities we can categorize and we can, we can generalize, as scientists like to do. Um, but every Oedipal story is a little different from every other Oedipal story. Um, our, 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 our sexual, uh, um, our sexuality is as unique as, as, as our fingerprints or our DNA code. Um, but, but there are, uh, patterns and we can study these patterns in the narratives. Um, okay. Uh, for Freud, Sexuality always comes first and invests other areas. Uh, other activities become sexualized. Um, but sex is the raw material and it can be extended to other things so that one can sexualize one's speaking. Uh, the act of looking can be sexualized. The act of hearing can be sexualized. Um, um, sexuality can be transformed or displaced in all kinds of ways. Uh, so what looks like aggression may well, on a deeper level, uh, turn out to be sexual. But Freud seldom saw it the other way around. Um, he, he seldom uh, considered, for example, how aggression can take a sexual form. Um, a lot of sexuality, well, the feminists know this for a long time. They've been telling us that rape is not really about sex. It's about, it's about aggression, uh, dominance, uh, violence, humiliation, not about sexuality. 
so uh, there are all kinds of other motives that can be disguised underneath sexuality that appear sexually but really something else is going on entirely. Uh, anyone who knows anything about seduction, I suppose, understands how what can appear to be sexual may in fact be governed by uh, many other aims and motives. But Freud seemed to be stuck on the idea that, that sex is fundamental and everything else is an expression of sexuality, <laughs> rather than sexuality being an expression of, of other things. Um, uh, I don't mean in this way to, to, to devalue uh, Freud's psychosexual stages of development. Um, but whereas he saw them as fundamentally biologically determined, um, I see them in terms of um, distinctively different narratives, uh, worlds of meaning. So a person fixated in the oral stage uh, lives as if all the world is a kitchen. Um, is it lunchtime yet? Um, uh, am I empty? Am I full? Um, should I swallow this or, or is it good? Should I f swallow this or is it bad or poisonous? Should I spit it out? Uh, when will I get to fill up again? Uh, so it's all about the mouth and the lips and the tongue and it's all about being empty or being full. When teeth come in, it then becomes about biting, not just uh, sucking, but now biting. And so aggression can come into orality and one can be orally aggressive uh, and then and then people who are fixated in the anal phase uh, they're living in a world in in which all the world is 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 a bathroom and uh um can i go when i want to go or do i have to go when he or or she tells me to go? who's the boss anyway Am I autonomous in my anal functioning or am I dominated and having to submit? So this is the DNS world, domination and submission. This is also the sadomasochistic world. Who is the sadist? Who is the masochist? Who is the dom? Who is the sub? It's about power, getting stuck in the anal phase. It's all about power. In the sexual underground, uh, the, 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 the anal world of the S&M dungeon, there's hardly any intercourse. They're not really all that interested in intercourse. It's much more about costumes and slaves and masters and doms and subs. Uh, that's the theater, the anal phase theater, but it's also about clean and dirty. Um, um, it's about anger. Um, um, okay, moving on into the phallic world, who has the biggest one? Whatever that thing is, is it a penis? Who has the biggest penis? Is it a curriculum vitae? Who has the longest CV, if you're an academic person? Um, who has the most money? Who has the biggest house? Phallic world, it's a pissing contest. Uh, competition. Uh, one can understand uh, capitalism as a kind of a giant pissing contest. Um, the haves and the haves nots. Uh, okay, the phallic world. Uh, and then that leads into the Oedipal world. All the world is a bedroom. And am I on the outside? Am I the excluded third? Uh, listening at the door, what the hell is going on in there? Is daddy hurting her? Are those noises she is making 
are, are those cries of pain or are they cries of pleasure? Uh, uh, what the hell? And, and boy, their minds aren't on me, it doesn't seem. What am I, chopped liver? I'm not invited into this party. Uh, I'm the excluded third. Two's company, I guess. Three's a crowd. Uh, um, so all the world is a bedroom, and I'm either, I'm either in there putting someone else in the position of the excluded third, or I'm the excluded third, one way or another. The triangle. Uh, um, okay, the edible world. Then there's the latency world. Peter Pan, he never grows up. Um, and then we move on into adolescence and into adulthood and so on. Uh, so I'm not casting doubt on these kinds of uh, psychosexual stages or the ideas of regression and fixation, but I don't think of this as a biological drive that is, is, is at work here. Uh, what we're talking about uh, are, are different narratives and different worlds of meaning. And of course, the body is involved in these things, but they don't bubble up from the body. Um, these Already, the child is a meaning maker, and, and he's getting caught up, getting caught in the fantasy, spelt with a PH, Ella Melanie Klein, unconscious fantasies, getting caught up in the fantasies. And these fantasies will shape his sexuality for the rest of his life. With this, I'm, I'm also with Freud. By age five or six, some of these core uh, fantasies are laid down and, and powerfully shape uh, a person's sexuality. Um, some people's sexuality is highly oral. Others have anal, uh, SNM, DNS, BDSM sexuality, and others are highly phallic, caught up in phallic narratives, and others are very addicted to Oedipal narratives of one kind or another. Our sexuality is shaped in this way. Um, uh, what we desire and what we dread. Um, we dread being a loser. We dread, um, we dread being the one without. Uh, um, at every stage, as Eric Erickson said, there is, there is a challenge um, that is either successfully mastered or not. Do we achieve basic trust or do we wind up with basic mistrust in the oral phase? Do we achieve autonomy in the anal phase or are we left with overwhelming shame and self-doubt? Um, in the phallic Oedipal phase, do we, do we achieve initiative? Um, um, or do we wind up with a whole lot of inhibition uh, and so on. Okay, our sexuality, Freud got it right. It's very much shaped in childhood um, in, in the ways that I've just spoken about. Okay, so, so human sexuality is, is fraught through with fantasy. Um, so let me address what's the difference between, between healthy and unhealthy, or, well, I don't like those medical uh, metaphors, so let's switch that. What's the difference between mature and immature sexuality? Uh, or one could say between creative and destructive sexuality. Um, for many years, psychoanalysts thought that healthy sexuality was sexuality purged of aggression. That is, it was fully libidinal, fully loving sexuality. And I well recall when um, Robert Stoller came to Toronto and gave a, a lecture in which he announced that fully loving, fully libidinal sexuality is so boring, it's not even worth having. Um, he argued quite convincingly that sexual excitement 
is involved with risk and danger and aggression and transgression. For sex to be exciting, Stoller says, it has to be in some way transgressive, that is, naughty. So if sex isn't dirty, if it isn't naughty, if it isn't in some way transgressive, then boring. And now we know something about the widespread phenomenon of marital deadbed. Uh, you know, they're married for a few years, then the kids come, and after the requisite number of kids are obtained, often the sex life kind of dies. Uh, this is not always the case. And so Otto Kernberg, for one, gets interested in what about those marriages which do not succumb to dead bed that stay sexually alive? We know that behind the white picket fence, um, many couples have stopped having sex for years. But what about those who carry on and maintain an enjoyable sex life for decades? How do they do that? Well, Kernberg agrees with Robert Stoller uh, that they do that by managing to become what Sergio Benvenuto in his wonderful uh, book, What is Perversion? He uses the term accomplice. In a healthy sex life, in a, in a, in a, in a functional marriage, the partners become each other's accomplices. Accomplices in crime. Crime in quotes. Like Bonnie and Clyde were accomplices in crime. But I'm talking now about accomplices in sexual quotes crime. That is, they know how to get naughty with each other. They know how to get down. They know how to play in uh, exciting and provocative ways. And nobody gets hurt. And they do this in ways that are safe, socially safe, so that they are not shamed and humiliated. Um, so they maintain a certain amount of discretion. Um, and they do this privately and in this way they thrill one another and their sex life remains alive. Uh, but what opposes this is the unresolved puritanical superego in both partners. Uh, her unresolved puritanical superego, sex is dirty, it's not quite right. It's unbecoming. It's sinful. That links up with his puritanical superego. And the result is that they can't even talk about sex, let alone perform it very well. Um, if they both go into analysis, that superego should be broken down. Uh, they should be freed up to become who they are. They should discover what turns them on. They should learn about their kinks that may have been suppressed for years. Um, he gradually acquires the confidence to begin to speak to her about his hitherto hidden interests. And maybe she gets freed up to begin to know about and speak to him about hers. And maybe out of all of this comes a creative capacity to be each other's accomplices and to work out a creative drama. Because, of course, this is the dramaturgical view of human sexuality. The dra in, in general, the dramaturgical view is that we are not like other animals. We are symboling animals. We, we live through our narratives and through our dramas and through the costumes that we put on 
in the roles that we play and the parts that we play. Um, and we carry this into the bedroom and we now have a dramaturgical view of human sexuality. Unfortunately, a lot of people uh, are unable to, to engineer anything like an exciting uh, drama. They're too moralistic. They're too crushed by their moralistic superego that insists that they be proper, whatever that's supposed to mean. And uh, the result is there isn't much fun. Okay, uh, so psychoanalysis then teaches us that uh, a good deal of our sexuality remains unconscious in many cases because the puritanical superego bans it from consciousness. Psychoanalysis works by helping to make what is unconscious conscious. Someone goes into analysis, they start to learn. They start to de-repress what has been repressed. He begins to acknowledge some of the kinks that he's been ashamed of since, he's, since he was a little boy or at least an adolescent. Secretly, he's been watching porn. Uh, finally, he begins to be able to talk to his analyst about what are the particular kinds of porn that turn him on. And then we learn a great deal about him. And we often understand that that choice of porn is directly related to certain events in his childhood involving mother and father and siblings and the Oedipal dynamic and pre-Oedipal issues. Those are the early experiences that shape the particular sexual fantasies that ultimately wind up producing an interest in a particular kind of porn. Um, and maybe if she goes into analysis, a similar process is happening and she's beginning to learn something about the childhood origins of her own particular sexual proclivities that she has been deeply ashamed of and unable to let herself know very much about let alone anyone else. And maybe these two begin to be able to talk to each other um, about these things and to begin to play with these things in a way that, that they can produce uh, a meaningful and pleasurable sex life. Okay.